So we are happy to have uh, Peter Saunak all the way from Princeton early in the morning. And he'll tell us about uh, Plancherelle measure and Hecke eigenvalues. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be part of this great celebration of Bala Subramanian. Uh, I uh, know Bala, I've met him on a few occasions, but I certainly don't know him the way many of the other participants know him by visiting him for long periods and working with him. However, I've studied some of his papers and I will start maybe with uh, one of his papers with Ramachandran, but before Ram, Ramachandra, but before I start, everything I discuss here that's new is joined with Evita Nestoridi, who's a uh, faculty member here at Princeton and a former student of Percy Diaconi. So you can see the word cut off and I'll get back to that. That is uh, one of her primary interests. And Nina Zubrilina, who's a uh, second year graduate student here. And let me also make clear that this is work in progress. So maybe theorems with a little t are being written up and any mistakes that anybody can point to are go on my head and not on theirs. All right, so let me stop. So there's this, uh, you don't see anything uh, obscuring anything, right? Uh, for me, it's the, I don't know why it's obscuring. Uh, it's clean no, for you. The it's common thing, the bar great. obscures your, our screen is fine. Our screen okay. is fine. It's great here. All right, okay. So I wanna start with a paper of Bala, Bala and Ramachandra from 1976, which uh, with a beautiful title of the place of an identity of Ramanujan in prime number theory. This is a paper which um, has uh, only two math side <laughs> reviews, and it's an extremely important paper, as I want to explain to you right now. And I'll go through a little bit in the history. So in this paper, they show how to incorporate some elementary upper bound sieve theory to give a standard zero free region. Now, by standard, I mean here logarithm types. I'm not interested in the powers of logarithm. Of course, there's the work of Vinogradov, which gives logs to uh, fractional powers. Those, of course, for Zeta are remarkable achievements. They're not so useful. The, uh, the main uh, standard zero-free region, I mean the, the method of Adamard de la Vallée Poussin, which gives uh, a kind of logarithm versus a power or ineffective zero-free region. And they discuss uh, how you can get this from an identity of Ramanujan, which is in the simplest version being the one I'm writing down here. I think it was Ingham who first noted that this uh, Ramanujan identity together with a simple lemma about positive coefficient Dirichlet series gives you a one line proof of the prime number theorem, but it gives a poor lower bound for L1 plus IT, something like T to the minus a half as T climbs up the line one. And what they observe is that you can recover essentially the best, or let's say just a standard zero free region by using some very elementary upper bound serves, which are elementary, uh, but very useful uh, by estimating this uh, quantity sigma it or at primes, and then uh, showing that for most primes, this quantity has to be quite big. So I'll call it a sieve bootstrap. And it's that rather than uh, Ramanujan's identity that I think has a fundamental place in the theory of numbers, as I'll explain now. Now, uh, there may not be that many references to this paper in Math SciNet, which is, I think, everybody's standard today. But if you make it into Titchmarsh's book on the zeta function, then you've done something that's actually of substance. And Heath Brown, in his updated comments to Titchmarsh's book on zeta, points to their paper as a means to recover without the usual uh, trigonometric polynomials, which produce more, more zeros than poles and give you a standard free zero, re standard zero free region. He points to their paper as, as a, a very novel and interesting idea. He also points to another proof of the non-vanishing of the zeta function on the line one using Eisenstein series. In fact, he uh, adds quite a lot to the book to, in another chapter in order to give this proof, which is a spectral proof, uh, differential equation proof, and uh, in my view, the most important proof that exists for the reasons I'm about to give, give you right now. Uh, on the other hand, he says the uh, uh, 
region, uh, the lower bound given by the spectral or by this Eisenstein proof gives a very poor zero free region. And I have a paper in which I, uh, I'll return to in a second, show that actually the bootstrap argument of um, Bala and Ramachandra allows you to bootstrap the Eisenstein proof to get, also get a zero free region, which is standard. And so it doesn't give you something that's bad, actually, it gives you something good. But as long as you add this sub argument, this elementary sub argument. So uh, to my view, that's very important and so important that let me point the following out. So in the context of automorphic L functions, the Eisenstein series coupled with this bootstrap is in fact the most powerful method known to mankind today to prove non-vanishing on the line one. It works in situations where Adamard and De La Vallée-Poussin can't possibly work because you're proving non-vanishing on the line one when you don't even know that, that the Euler product converges near the line one. It only converges for real part of S bigger than three over two. This is a temporary uh, holdup in the sense that if you knew Langdon, Langdon's functoriality, you would be able to reduce all the problems to what are called standard L functions. And then uh, maybe this would be less relevant, but that's far off. And uh, you could argue that all these things in an ideal world would be gone once somebody understands the Riemann hypothesis. So I'm talking about present day technology. And from that point of view, this proof coupled with this bootstrap gives all, especially in the T aspect, gives the best known and every known case and cases that Adamard and De La Vallée-Poussin can't arrange because you can't concoct the right L functions, the right combination of L functions to produce more zeros than poles as they invented. So you'll find this discussed in a paper of mine. And then Gelbart and Lapid uh, carried this out for the general situation in the Langland Shahidi method. Goldfield and Lee looked at a very interesting problem. So let me just end with that case. That is the Rankin Selberg L function. And Humphreys actually used the sub method uh, more efficiently to show that this uh, Bala Ramachandra method actually gives you a standard zero free region for all Rankin Selberg L functions on GLN. And it's a misunderstanding that uh, without that, uh, you can't deal with all cases, in particular if pi and pi prime are not one of themselves dual. And we don't know how to concoct the functions in our present understanding. But this method of Bala works. So, uh, Bala, if I give you the following today, your method. I would say is uh, the best we know towards the Riemann hypothesis. When I talk about the Riemann hypothesis, I mean the grand Riemann hypothesis for all automorphic L functions. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> I love that paper. <laughs> and, uh, it's a great paper and it's a place, the method has a place in the theory of L functions, not for Dirichlet L functions as much where other methods have been uh, slightly stronger, but in generality. All right. I will now turn to the topic of my talk, which is concerning bounding the size of spaces of automorphic forms and then an application, and it's the application uh, that the th three of us have been looking at. Uh, in a paper a long time ago, in 1984, when I was mainly interested only in mass forms, I only formulated this and proved it for mass forms, I proved the following theorem, that if you take uh, all Hecker mass forms for the full modular group SL2Z, and you order the, uh, these forms by their Archimedean eigenvalue, by the Laplace eigenvalue. So that's how you order them, it's their con conductor. And you form the numbers lambda fp, which is two cosine. So you define theta fp by this relation. And if the Ramanujan conjecture is true for mass forms, which we still don't know, then these thetas are between zero and pi, but otherwise they could be uh, off zero and pi. The lambdas, of course, are between there are bounds which are quite strong. But the theorem that I was interested in then was that if you look at this infinite vector, so for each f you have an infinite vector of numbers, which are the second eigenvalue, the third eigenvalue, the fifth eigenvalue, the pth eigenvalue for each prime p, it's in this infinite product space. And as you order the f's with respect to their size, this becomes equidistributed with respect to a very important measure in this case, it's a product measure. It's a product of piadic Plancherel measures, as in the title of this talk, which are exactly 
these measures, so they are supported on zero pi. There are a few things I want to point out about it, but uh, these become equidistributed with respect to that. And the proof uh, it uses the Selberg trace formula for SL2Z uh, and traces of Hecker operators. There are two things I want to point out about these measures. The first is that these periodic Plancherel measures for each prime P vanish at zero and pi. So the sine squared theta vanishes at zero and pi, and this will be critical to the highlight of this lecture is, is exactly that vanishing. And the second thing is as P goes to infinity, this measure converges to another measure, which is very important called the cytotate measure. So these are two points I wanted to point out, and this is a general fact. Um, all right, in 93, and I'll tell you a story about this in a moment. Sir, uh, I first learned of this. He was giving a lecture here, a colloquium here in Princeton. I think Zev was probably also in the audience. Proved the following theorem. It's the same theorem, but just for Hecker eigenvalues of holomorphic forms of even integral weight for gamma naught n, so not full level, but we letting the n go to infinity. He fixed P, let N go to infinity. He also allowed the weight to go infinity, but his primary interest was N going to infinity. This is by far the most interesting case of, you'll see in a second why. Again, he puts lambda FP, the, the Ramanujan conjecture asserts that uh, this ratio is at most two. So you write it now uniquely as two cosine theta FP, and now theta FP is a, a number between zero and one, it's the angle. And his theorem is that as n goes to infinity, these eigenvalues become equidistributed with respect to the Piadic Plancherel measure. I should have said that the Piadic Plancherel measure, one more thing about it, is uh, comes very naturally from the trace formula. It's the contribution to the trace formula of the identity conjugacy class as computed by Harishandra in quite great generality. So that's completely natural from every point of view. Uh, now what's happened? I've lost my screen. Uh, you see me. I, we see you. You are now in, uh, you're now back to the slide about mass forms. Uh, your share screen is paused. So how do I undo that? Resume share. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Resume share. I don't know. Uh, there's something called crowd strike comes and strikes me every now and then. I don't know what it is. It's probably some bug I've got. All right. So uh, it's a contribution from the identity conjugacy class. And the other thing that will be important for later is it's also on the P plus one regular tree, the uh, random walk uh, return uh, uh, Keston measure. They're all the same thing. All right, so Sarah proves this theorem, which is the same theorem, and he fixed one prime. And his interest was K equals two, holomorphic forms of weight two, because very in, he was very interested in the modular curve X naught N, it's Jacobian, and its behavior as to how decomposed as isogenies, uh, up to isogeny as a product. And you'll see why in a second. So he fixes a number D. Uh, an integer d, and he defines all the uh, modular forms. So these are uh, Hecker eigenforms for level n, weight 2, and this d is fixed, for which the lambdas, <coughs> the actual eigenvalues, are in a field. They'll always be in a totally real field in the way of normalized things here. I'm looking, there's no central character. Totally real field of degree at most d. So for example, if D is one, we're looking at all the modular forms whose coefficients are integers. If D is two, they align in quadratic extension. And in general, by the work of Shimura, there's a Galois orbit. There are these, uh, the forms break up into Galois orbits depending on how their coefficients, uh, where they lie. And that is how the Jacobian decomposes and how that behaves is quite mysterious. So as I said, if D is one, this is just the, all the modular forms whose coefficients are integers. And at that point, this was 1993, I was sitting next to Andrew Wiles in the lecture. Wiles had already told me he thought he could prove the Shimura Taniyama conjecture. And Sir was wondering aloud whether there are enough modular forms to accommodate the conjecture. 
He said, are there enough modular forms with integer coefficients on level n? So maybe there aren't enough to accommodate all elliptic curves. Of course, Andrew, if any of you know him, just sat there quietly and silently, he didn't say a word. <laughs> so this was his interest. And uh, of course, uh, since then, Wiles uh, didn't prove that theorem. And uh, these uh, the S2D, with these one would just be all elliptic curve modular forms. And uh, he's asking to bound that number while showed us that there are enough of those, remarkably proved it. The number of elliptic curves uh, with conductor N uh, has a non-trivial bound uh, and which is much smaller than N. So the, the, the fact is there's an ample room here. And in fact, one can even improve that exponent a little bit. This was done by Lillian Pierce and uh, Helfgott and Venkatesh sort of simultaneously. So that case we understand, but Sarah did something rather interesting with his equidistribution theorem. He proved that the, uh, for any fixed D, and when D is large, we don't know much about this decomposition, that uh, the number of modular forms whose coefficients lie in fields of degree at most D is little O of the total number. <laughs> it's just a modest improvement, but that's what he was after. And he asked if you can get an exponent here. In other words, a power saving. And I'll return to that. So that was Sarah's interest. Uh, and it was a very clever use of this equidistribution that he proved. Ram Murthy and Sinha in 2007 uh, worked quite hard to um, not giving the dependence on D. They gave uh, explicit dependence on D here, which uh, requires going through Sarah's argument and counting number fields uh, with certain properties and uh, that bound depends very poorly on D, but they, instead of getting little O, uh, are able to put a log there, small step towards Sarah's question. And um, uh, that also allows you to identify all uh, X naught Ns, which uh, have only integer coefficients, meaning they, they decompose into products of elliptic curves, like the generalization of X naught 11, which is an elliptic curve. All right, so Sarah's uh, was interested in that, and I'll return to that in a minute. I want to point out there's some uh, improvements or results which are rather pretty, which do get power savings or even more. So the case of weight one is very different. So if you take weight one holomorphic forms, which are uh, holomorphic, then there's a well-known theorem of Deline and Sarah that there's a one-one correspondence with these. I allow a quadratic central character. There's a one-one correspondence between these and uh, finite, finite. I emphasize finite two-dimensional irreducible Galois representation. Now, if you, the finite subgroups of the GL2C are, are very, they're the platonic solid groups and some simple CM guys. So we understand them very well and they, traces of those, which will then be the coefficients, are then going to lie in a finite set. And one can exploit that to actually get a power saving. This was first done in a beautiful paper by Duke. He uses the Peterson formula in an undual form. And uh, it was improved uh, a little bit later by Michel Venkatesh. I have a nice story about that too. Venkatesh was a, uh, I don't know, maybe a second year graduate student here in Princeton, and he came into my office pointing out that he could improve on Duke's theorem. And I got on the very same day an uh, email from Michelle with the exact same improvement. So I thought, well, okay, I can be, I, would, I must do the obvious thing here is they must write a joint paper, which they did, and that's their paper. And it was the beginning of a long, uh, beautiful collaboration. So one can get a power saving for weight one, but the reason is because the Fourier, the coefficients, the lambda Fn's are in a finite set period, as opposed to what's happening in weight two. All right, on the other hand, there is some uh, very beautiful breakthrough recently in the K aspect, and the K aspect's very different, and it's quite natural that one should be using the R equals T methods of Wiles and Taylor to attack this problem, the Galois deformations, which has, uh, which uh, actually were the methods that allowed you to prove the uh, Shimura-Tanayama conjectures, you know. 
And uh, last year, Caligari and Sardari proved the following beautiful theorem that if you fix P, the, the, the condition on P is just technical. If you fix P greater equal to five and you look at mass, uh, not mass, Hecker eigenforms of weight, even weight K, and you ask about the multiplicity, in other words, how many of these have their coefficient equal to zero? They have some other results about not zero, but equal to zero, which is the most interesting. And they show they're only finitely many. That's quite beautiful. That's as strong as anything can be. There are only finitely many holomorphic forms of K. So the K aspect's very different, and the proofs use the full force of the interpretation in terms of Galois representations. On the other hand, it, these methods so far have not worked in the N aspect. They, whenever you prove a R equals T theorem, you might say you're counting some other objects, but those other objects, nobody knows how to count. The elliptic curves with conductor N, one can make some estimates. All right, so I'll now state the first. Now, this is a little, little t. I'm following a tradition of Mumford. Little t means being written up. A little theorem of one of the three of us. Fix a, con a number big less than two. And uh, that number is going to be fixed. And that it can be as close to two as I like is important. Choose any. Now, the number that's going to go to infinity is capital N. We've only worked this out so far for n prime, but that doesn't matter. That it's going to get more complicated in general. Uh, suppose you have r primes that uh, do not divide n. That's a misprint there. Uh, and I've got degrees or integers l1 for each r and such that l1 log p1 plus lr pr is less than or equal to this constant, which is less than two times log n and form any polynomial in R variables in cosine theta of degree L1 in the first variable and L2 in the second variable up to LR in the Rth variable. Then if you take one over the cardinality of the number of elements in S2N, I should have said that uh, in weight one, we, the, the, theorem, the Duke work is about the dimension of the space of weight one forms. That doesn't, uh, Riemann rock doesn't give you that dimension. Of course, we know the dimension here of S2n by Riemann rock. So one over the number of forms, f in S2n of the square of this polynomial whose degrees are allowed to be that big. And uh, you let n go to infinity and that will converge. So this is a quantitative version. And I'll say a few words about it. Quantitative version of this convergence theorem that I mentioned at the beginning. That will converge to, so it's one plus little o one times the integral against the Planch product Plancherel measures of the same function. And the important thing here is that the polynomials are allowed to have arbitrary coefficients. This is, I'm allowed to choose P, the only condition is on the degrees so that I can play a game and choose very optimal P's in several variables here. Okay, so that's the theorem. Let me say a few words. So the quantitative has uh, a twofold significance. The flexibility in several variables, which nobody seems to have exploited before, but uh, I, we're going to do it now. So the degrees, I, I just said this, the degrees, the only thing that's limited is the degrees, but not the coefficient. So it's really a bilinear inequality built in with these polynomials in several variables. Part, the second comment I wanna make is the restriction <coughs> on the degrees, I repeat it, to allow C as close to two will be crucial in the application to uh, non backtracking. All right, let me say a word about methodology here. So if you use only the trace formula, that's what uh, I had used, that's what Sir used, that's what Ram Murthy and his co-author were using. Then, uh, and you just use, you can use a trace formula and then you can try work much harder, but what happens when you use a trace formula? You get class numbers of, of quadratic orders. And if you just put bounds, uh, they show bounds, but you uh, forego cancellation. If you just bound, put bounds for class numbers, you can achieve the above. And if you work quite hard with C less than one, but not equal to one. You could try work much harder and then take the trace formula and uh, take the class number and write it down in terms of a short Dirichlet series, because it's an L value at one, switch orders and work galore you will land up with close to month sums, whether you like it or not. So it makes much more sense to do the step immediately and go and allow close to month sums. But that means instead of taking this sum with 
weight one, you put a weight here, which has got a symmetric square L function. Experts are all familiar with this. Uh, and then you get a sum which has actually a different answer on the right hand side, completely different answer. You don't, instead of getting the product of the Plancherel measures, you get a product of the Sato Tate measures. So they, it's a subtle change, but it's a change that we've faced over the years. And uh, that's the way we'll go. It's uh, easier because the, uh, you get the Klostermann sums directly. The uh, use of this and the removal of weights is explained in, uh, was carried out uh, in detail in my, a paper of Ivan H. Lowe and myself about low lying zeros connected with uh, what Chantal was talking about. And we uh, do this in general and we remove the weights there assuming the Riemann hypothesis because throughout the paper we're assuming the Riemann hypothesis. So you have to remove the weights without assuming the Riemann hypothesis. And this can be done, and I think it's first explained, I'll explain right now. But before I do that, I want to say, this is a remarkable idea. You actually want to write the trace formula down. You don't want those weights. So the idea of bringing in the weights and then removing them in order to get close to one sums, which give you cancellation that you don't see that easily otherwise, goes back, I think, first to a beautiful paper of Henrik Ivanich, where he improves the remainder term in the prime geodesic theorem precisely by this tool. Uh, for the purpose of this multiplicity, I have a letter to Rupik. You can find it out. You can find it on the, on, on, on the IAS website, where I explain that you can double a range. You can halve the constant in a multiplicity. You can work very hard to get square root extra cancellation to replace a number which is terrible by half that number. It completely disappointing application. But the double of the range is entirely in this lecture for part two. All right, so now I'll give you corollaries. So firstly, we can do much better on Sarah's theory, uh, question. We can give a bound of the cardinality divided by log n to any power, but we don't get Sn to a power less than one that I don't see how to do, but uh, this is much stronger than just log n. And the proof from the main theorem follows from uh, Sarah's insight that if you uh, fix D, if you fix the number fields in which the Fourier coefficients are going to lie, and you fix a finite number of primes, then because all the numbers and all the Galois conjugates are also going to satisfy the bounds, you'll only have finitely, the number that, the, this number will depend terribly on D and P1 to PR, but eventually you write down a finite number of polynomials with integer coefficients whose roots contain all the possible eigenvalues. And then you get to, so D, so you fix the P's and the D. So by the way, this notation here means you first fix A arbitrarily large, and then the constant depends on A, as you know. So you fix those, you get a finite number of values, and then you want to actually give an upper bound for the number of uh, Fs, which in the torus, so I have, uh, R, uh, I have R dimensional space, that's how we gain the A here. In the R dimensional space, uh, we can come back here and then optimize our choice of the polynomial. So we make a polynomial in several variables, which has its mean respect with respect to the Plancherel measures small, but its value large at the exact points you want to give a bound and that way you can get uh, log to any power. And the second corollary that I'm going to use before I change to a different, as in Monty Python, something completely different, uh, is this fact that just for one prime, and I'll be only using this for one prime, and this is where it's very important that we can allow C to go bigger than one. The fact that we can get as far as two is nice, but the this particular application just demands that you go over the threshold of one. And so if I have a sum, uh, one over the cardinality of uh, the number of forms of weight two, holomorphic cusp forms, and I sum over those a polynomial of degree <clears throat> at most C times log N to the base P. So that the, the, the condition on the degrees of the polynomials, if there's just one becomes this. And it's asymptotic to the integral of P against the Plancherel measure. Okay, so uh, that's the first half of my lecture. Any questions? Uh, let me say a word here. Uh, I've now given a few of these lectures. It's completely nuts. You don't know if people are actually sleeping or listening to you. 
Zev is, uh, will interrupt if he wants to, I know that, but let me invite anybody else to interrupt. Uh, and if you have a chat, then Zev will just put you in charge of. Oh, okay, of just a trivial question to, for, yeah. for the mood. So the, the or depends on the A, right? Sorry, the, which? The number of primes you play with. That depends yeah, yeah, on yeah, the of a. course, yeah, yeah. The, you want to make achieve. A, yeah, exactly. R is A, basically, yeah. Okay, silly question. How does it depend, the, the or on, on A? So how many primes do you need no, to No, no, it's the same. It's the same. It's the same. It's the same. same. It's the, same. Uh -huh. okay. the constant Good. is what's terrible. Yeah, uh, that's okay. exactly the Okay, just so, for the mood, the, I, I know you, you like questions. You, you don't like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. If, you just use one prime, yes. if you just use one prime, you'll recover Murti. Oh, the Murti, Murti, Murti. Yeah, Murti yes. is the one who put the log there. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. Okay. But uh, you can see that this is somewhere between weight one and weight two, because in weight one, uh, you don't have to worry about the primes because all the numbers are in a finite set for all primes. So you just, you can use a large sieve directly and it's much, much easier. But here we actually have to interpolate and make a polynomial large at a point. And uh, yeah, okay. The answer is A equals R. Sorry, I should have said that. All right, now for something completely different, and there's another question. Yeah, um, um, so if you could uh, get C up to infinity, would it give you a power saving? Uh, no, so the dependence in D is so, uh, the power saving for fixed D, yeah, I, we, this, uh, okay, so I don't right know. right now C is two. Yeah, so, yeah, right, right, C is at most two, yeah. Uh, I don't know exactly, I've, uh, the answer is I don't know. Okay, good questions. I don't. All right, so we're going to do something that uh, I've always wondered what Percy Diaconis does and why it's so exciting. And now I'm kind of get, I'm, I'm bored into it. And this is the following. Uh, suppose you go uh, and ask how many shuffles in a casino do they do before they stop shuffling? And it turns out exactly seven. And that's because if you shuffle six times, it's not, the, the deck won't be random. And if once you hit seven, it's pretty much random. And if by the shuffle one more time, it'll be really random. And this phenomenon is called sharp bounded cutoff. And there aren't many cases where it's known. And it's known for the symmetric group with the riffle shuffle, for example. But uh, we're gonna be looking at a somewhat different setting. And there's a lot of his, uh, literature around this. And it's a big subject about sharp cutoffs for random walks. And as you can guess, I'll be interested in the case of a Ramanujan graph where what is the sharp cutoff, bounded cutoff. So we'll be looking at a, uh, so we'll do combinatorics for a little while, yeah? So X is a connected D regular graph. For us, D will always be P plus one. Uh, you can assume P is not a prime. Uh, the only cases where we know these graphs exist are of the form prime power plus one because I'm going to make a non-bipartite Ramanujan graph and the work of Spielman, Srivastava Sri and um, uh, uh, Marcus, uh, which produces uh, produce any uh, bipartite Ramanujan graphs. So, uh, so far we only know how to make these graphs in the number theoretic case, but the discussion makes sense anyway. So let me start without Ramanujan graphs. We have these graphs, they are connected. Uh, D is fixed. I'm interested in these three, say, and the number of vertices is going to infinity. And this non backtracking random walk, a lot, a lot of words there, is the following. We start on our graph, we start at a point X, and we move at the beginning to one of its D neighbors, P plus one neighbors, at random e with equal probability. And then we do something that's not, which is clever, I think. Instead of allowing myself to walk where I just came from, which is clearly a waste of time if I want to equidistribute quickly, uh, we do this non-backtracking. We don't go back to where we just came from. We have to remember where we came from. And then we move to one of the P neighbors from that step on. And then we make T steps. And after T steps, we'll be somewhere and we'll have a probability distribution over the vertices of where we are and there will be a starting point. So things will depend on the starting point. So after T steps, no matter what I do, the number of points, I the number of vertices I land up 
at, if I count with multiplicity, is simply p plus one for the first and then p to the t minus one. So this number n is extremely important. It's a number of endpoints with multiplicity that I'll end up at. All right, so the question that has evolved in this community of uh, non-backtracking um, sharp cutoff is how quickly do we become equidistributed? And how do you measure whether you're, you're close to uniform? So let PTXY be the probability of landing at Y after T steps starting at X. So this is some counting that we are gonna do spectrally eventually, of course. And the measure of closeness that uh, is introduced by these early works and seems to have stuck throughout the theory as the, uh, the most natural is the total variation, which we divide by a half here to make a number between zero and one. So you see, if I start at X and N is very large, I'm, my probability distribution is just a delta mass at, the origin, at X. On the other hand, what I'm aiming for is the uniform distribution, one over the number of vertices, that's the steady state. And we're asking how close are we to that? And we make this uh, total variation distance. And to begin with, we'll be very close to one, I've divided by two here because I'll just be a delta function at one point and so I'll be completely off at that one point and completely off at all the other points. And so that would be two divided by two, it'll be one. And what happens is that for a long time, you can't be anything but one. And then what we're looking for is there's gonna be a, a moment at which it'll start to drop and then does it drop very rapidly and that's this question of cutoff and sharp cutoff. And what is that cutoff time and what is the window of the cutoff? So the most important number we define to measure this is the number T, which is the number of steps, the minimum number of steps before the maximum total variation. So we allow ourselves to start at any X. So if you're shuffling decks, you don't know, the deck will be given to you in some position and then you're going to shuffle and get from any starting point. So the maximum over X, and you want this t to be less than eta. And the question is, what does this function t of eta look like? So as I was saying, to begin with, it's gonna be very close to one, and then we're going to be interested when t gets close to zero. Now, a very simple combinatorial thing here, which is extremely important for us, because we're gonna see absolutely optimal sharp cutoff, completely optimal. So if the number of, Play, uh, endpoints we can arrive at is less than the total number of vertices, we haven't got a chance to be equidistributed. No matter how, never got nothing to do with the random walk, nothing random. So you can compute the total variation and it's simply the ratio of the number of um, unoccupied vertices starting from X divided by N. So if at time one or zero, you're on one point, so this is basically going to be n over n, and the total variation is one. And then just because you can only visit each guy, at, um, if, you, if you were lucky enough that you visited each guy exactly once, the total variation will be, starting at any x, will be one minus this number n over n. So it shows that if n, which remember was p plus one times p to the t minus one, if that's less than n, we can't even start to ask for the total variation to start dropping away from one. That's an absolute combinatorial limit. So if you actually compute what that means is you'll find that the time to get to one minus epsilon, just to drop from one, is gonna be at least log to the base P of N. This is the most important number. This is the cutoff time, because that's the number related to capital N that I just described, minus log one epsilon inverse. So uh, if epsilon here is, is very small, so you near one, you have, so to begin with, you'll be at one. I'll show you a picture in a minute. And then you're gonna start to drop uh, only, you can only start to drop at log N to the base P. Okay, so there are the, the decisive theorems that were proved a few years ago on this problem after a lot of work, uh, they were interested not only in this non-backtracking, in fact, they were interested in the standard or simple as they call it random walk where the random walker goes, does not, goes back to where they came from. And then they, of course, equidistribute slower and this cutoff is not as pleasant, but it's statistically interesting. But I'm only interested in the non-backtracking random walk. And for that, they show a remarkable theorem that if you take a random P plus one regular graph. So 
n is going to infinity, you choose the graph at random by a standard model of random graph theory. Then the cutoff time, this t epsilon, so the t one minus epsilon is never going to be, so the, the, this, this number log p n is where things start to happen. And if you want to get this to be the probability, the total variation to be less than epsilon, you going to take at, at most log the same log p plus three times log one of epsilon. So there's a log of epsilon inverse. Here's a log of, that's a lower bound, that's an upper bound. So what you have is that log to the base p of n is the cutoff time. And the window for the cutoff is bounded. Just like I was telling you with the deck of cards, six, you're not quite, seven, you're good, eight, you're already wasting your time. So very sharp cutoff, and this is called the bounded window cutoff. And it's remarkable that the random the regular graph as n goes to infinity satisfies this with a bounded window. Okay, uh, we're not going to look at random graphs. We want to look at Ramanujan graphs. I remind you, a Ramanujan graph is a graph which is a deregular graph. D is p plus one. The eigenvalue, the biggest eigenvalue, the constant function gives you the eigenvalue p plus one. And we assume that all the other eigenvalues are less than two root p, just like in the Ramanujan conjectures. And of course, it is the Ramanujan conjectures that assert that certain graphs constructed in a certain way are Ramanujan. And uh, this, is, this, is, this picture, when I first saw it, explains everything that was in my head. I'd never seen this picture, but it's what I always thought a Ramanujan graph. So Lubotsky Phillips and I constructed various Ramanujan graphs. They're explicit, they're very beautiful. And uh, this one is corresponding to a Cayley graph of PGL, PSL2 F29. 29 is a prime, it's a field with 29 elements with six generators that are cunningly chosen. And the Jacquet Langlands correspondence is used at some point to show that this graph is Ramanujan. And this graph has the property that when you start at X, at the beginning, you look like the six regular tree. That's this girth. The girth is quite big. But then you come to this log base P. So in this case, P is six and N is 12,000 and something. And all of a sudden, uh, you seem to be uh, connecting to everybody, but uh, just exactly what the diameter is. Another question. This is what it looks like. So at the beginning, the girth is large. And the question is, for this kind of Ramanujan graph, what is the sharp cutoff? And this is the numerical picture that's from a paper of Lubetsky and Perez, who answer this all, all but answer this question. And here's the uh, sharp cutoff. So uh, this is the numerical experiment with that graph. It starts at one, and then it drops sh sharply to zero with a very sharp cutoff. This is the L1 and L2 cutoff, which I, I will uh, get into in a minute. And this is their bound from their paper, which uh, looks very good, but it's got a certain weakness, and I want to overcome that weakness. So Lubetsky and Paris show that if you're a Ramanujan graph, so this is a purely combinatorial statement. The only input is the properties of these eigenvalues being limited in the way I described. Then you have, in fact, sharp cutoff. Remember, they're trying to find if the random feature is true for Ramanujan. So they have one plus little over one log p to the base n is the cutoff. But they do not get a bounded window. So they have to go uh, a lot further, but <laughs> log log is not a lot, but that's this log log is what this uh, talk is about. I'm going to get rid of that log log. You have to actually take an extra bunch of steps in order to make sure that the total variation gets small. So they do not have a bounded window and that was rem uh, remained open. And that's the question I want to address, say, for these graphs. Okay. So now I can state the second theorem that we have. So the second theorem is a purely combinatorial theorem. It doesn't use all the stuff I was talking about before, but it's, a, uh, it's got the ideas of how you're going to do the rest. So you fix delta. So this now is a secondary parameter, which is fixed, which will be uh, a, a parameter that's very well behaved in the case of uh, those LPS graphs. You fix a delta and suppose that the girth of the graph grows like delta. Delta is a small number a constant, small constant times the same log n to the base p. So the, this is exactly this feature here in the, that the girth is quite large. Can't be too large, but these girths are, are quite large. Then uh, this cutoff, then in their theorem, 
we can get rid of the log log. So we have uh, the, what you'll see in a minute, which is the correct size log to the base P of N plus two log epsilon inverse. So if you want to go from uh, one to epsilon, you need to take another a bounded number of steps further. And there's a price you pay an extra bounded number of steps depending on this delta, which I'm thinking of as fixed. This is incorrect. Delta is two thirds for uh, the Ramanujan graph, but that's not going to change anything here. So in particular, this answers the question as to whether the LPS graphs have bounded window cutter for the non-backtracking walk. And the answer is yes. And this is uh, this theorem two resolves that. Now, let me say how we uh, attack this. And this is completely standard in this theory. Uh, the total variation was an L1 norm by Cauchy Schwartz. You can bound the L1 norm by the L2 norm uh, you can see if it's effective. And in this case, and quite remarkably, for the simple random walk, that's a bit of a problem. But for this uh, non backtracking walk, this works perfectly if you can understand the variances. And uh, many of us are very much involved in variances in these kind of uh, number theory problems. And this is exactly what's emerging here. So I've normalized here by that important number n, and then I take the L2 norm rather than the L1 norm summed over all y. And then if you just use the spectral expansion, and that's why we get, how we're going to get the eigenvalues into this, you find that this uh, variance, I'll call it, is the sum of uh, some polynomial. It's a polynomial that I would not have written down, but it's the polynomial that corresponds exactly to the non-backtracking random walk. It's a specific polynomial that, uh, in theta. And you need to compute the L2 norm summed over N. And the starting point is also in the answer here, phi j x squared. If I sum over x, this will disappear because phi j x squared, and if x is homogeneous, that's this discussion here, that then this is one over N. So this looks very much like the beginning. In fact, it is a kind of sum that we discussed in theorem one, once we translate all the way back to gamma naught N. There's a very important polynomial. It's the variance polynomial, which is this polynomial in terms of Chebyshev polynomials of the first and second kind. So the Chebyshev polynomial of the first kind is cos t theta, and it's, these are polynomials in cos theta of degree t, and the Chebyshev polynomial of the second kind is sine t plus one theta over sine theta. And this polynomial is the critical one to understand everything about the variance. And if you put in the bounds, so if you bound, uh, so this, this uh, the, the polynomial of the second, first, second, first, second, first kind is uniformly bounded. And then that's very friendly to you, that term. But this term has actually got a T in it at the origin. And that's the same origin at which Sato Tate, uh, the Plancherel measure vanishes. That's what they're going to be using. So at the origin, this is size T and that puts an extra T squared. And that's the extra log log they have in there analysis which we're trying to get rid of so it's all in this variance and the point here is now we can see clearly how it's connected to our starting so there's something different but very closely connected we are averaging over the eigenvalues of this graph so this graph's not necessarily coming from number theory but it will in a second and we're asking whether that average converges to the plancherel measure but the polynomial we're putting in here has a degree which is growing. So we're asking for a, re, a, a, a flexibility in convergence to Plancherel measure where we allow the polynomial to have a certain degree. Peter, and, Peter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hello. Show me, your, show me your Chebyshev polynomial. The n theta. Ah, thank you. Yeah, that's a theta. That should be TT. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, this man is always sharp. <laughs> the sharpest tool in the shed. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, so um, if you were able to say that this average with T at the size of log N to the base P, exactly that cutoff, this is exactly where we're trying to uh, establish this, uh, we would get and if we can put just, we don't have to worry about anything but the degree, we would get this and then we could compute this because it's just an integral and you'll get that actually the variance is nothing but one over N in this range, which is an absolutely beautiful answer and actually one that you can explain in terms of balls and boxes quite nicely. 
So if this were true, you would get this bound of log n to the base p plus two log one over epsilon, which is the bounded window cutoff with the optimal, this is completely optimal, I'm sure, and the real truth about the non-backtracking walk on a Ramanujan graph. Now, unfortunately, we don't know this. I don't know how to prove this other than if I put a girth assumption, I can make an approximation to this. But for all other graphs, uh, if I use the number theory and convert it back at least to graphs which come back to gamma naught n where we have we got this bound. So this is, I'll stop with this because I think I'm supposed to stop at about 9.50. Uh, so let me state the theorem. So if XQ is a Ramanujan graph corresponding to modular forms of weight two and level Q. So there are many very interesting graphs. The actual, uh, homogeneous graphs, the LPS graphs are not, they, they actually live on a, a, a full congruent subgroup, gamma Q, not gamma naught Q. So these graphs were constructed by Brunt first, they called Brunt matrix graphs from the theory of theta functions. Ihara constructed these graphs in a paper of his that deserves more attention. These are also the graphs that uh, algebraists love, they are Ramanujan graphs. They've been used for hash functions by Kristen Lauder and people like that. These are super singular isogeny graphs of the field with Q, F, Q squared elements, where you look at P isogenies. So Q is the Q and the P is our P in our discussion. You, and you make a graph by connecting uh, the super singular primes, the super singular elliptic curves, which are P isogenous. And you get a connected Ramanujan graph uh, and it's expressible in terms of these Brunt matrices as well. So all, for all those graphs, one can prove, thanks to theorem one, that you have sharp cutoff with this behavior. So you get exactly what you want. I have one caveat there, is in order to get something, there's an X here. So I have to, in these problem, and I haven't, we haven't sorted this out yet. I would like to have max over X, but right now we'll take a random starting point. So if I average over X, then it's a purely spectral statement and translates to convergence to Plancharel measure without having to worry about this. But in the large girth, we can allow X and still get it. So we obtain this and uh, this of course uses Jacquet Langland's correspondence to get into the position. So this comes from a quaternion algebra, the, the uh, graph and to get to this point uh, and actually you get the full beautiful answer for the variance thanks to the fact that we were able to not necessarily double, it, you didn't have to double the range in the main theorem. It's corollary two. We must be able to take C one plus epsilon, just one or slightly bigger than one. Uh, but as I was saying, if you want to go from below one to above one, you may as well try go hit two. And that's the, what uh, this method buys you of removal of weights and uh, you can't do that by just estimating the class numbers you have to get cancellation and that's what we do all right i'll stop there and happy birthday bala and uh, i hope you enjoyed my uh, discussion of your paper of uh, the place in number theory of identity of ramanujan i would change it to the place in number theory of your sub method to get zero thank you Thank you, Peter. I have a, a number of more slides, but I, I don't want to. People are, I'm sure, exhausted after a week. <laughs> and by the way, I, I apologize. Obviously, I couldn't go to the talks that were, well, I, I shouldn't say I couldn't. I could get up in the middle of the night. But if I uh, actually, did anyone discuss this paper of yours, Bala? Uh. I think Ravale had a mention of the paper. Okay. Well, I hope I didn't say the same thing, but I, I have no, a paper. No, no, he was looking from a different angle. Yeah. So uh, when I was, uh, I can tell you a further story just to end with this. Um, this proof using Eisenstein series, Henrik will know this. Uh, I had a lot of discussions with Selberg about it. I once asked him, this proof using Eisenstein series of the non-vanishing on the line one, what does it give in terms of zero free region? And he didn't want to answer. He just refused. He kind of froze and eventually said a very bad. <laughs> 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 and I was convinced that that's, it doesn't make sense. And by the way, if you look at the treatments 
in Langland Shahidi or the works of Shahidi primarily, the Jake Shahidi, they just treat this as ineffective. And I didn't like that. So I wanted to make it effective. And uh, I, I was quite happy to see that your method allows you to bootstrap further from an effective bound of a lower bound of one of a T to the half to the logarithm. And that's very significant. And I, d I think it's a completely misunderstood that rankin selberg is in good shape only because of your method at present. You, this is something that might change as people understand more cases of functoriality. Hey, Peter. Yeah, yeah, Henrik. Yeah, uh, if I remember correctly, I think it was in Stanford when Selberg visited you. I was there too, and somewhere chatting about the prime number theorem proved by Eisenstein series. And I don't know exactly what he said, but I remember the conversation and he was not very, um, so to speak, uh, optimistic about, you know, uh, th 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 this kind of... Uh, he actually, and you can find this on, uh, if you go to the Institute website and look under uh, the side, you'll see Selberg, and there are many things that were found in his office after he passed away that are posted there. And in particular, a series of lectures, one of which he gave at Stanford, one he gave in Zurich, uh, on this elementary proof of the prime, uh, on, no, not elementary, on this proof of the prime number theorem by formulating it in a very beautiful way in terms of double coset sums in a discrete subgroup of SL2R, which need not be SL2Z. So you get a, a statement that you prove for an arbitrary group when you specialize it to SL2Z, you get the prime number theorem elementarily. You will find that lecture, but the details are not so complete. In my write up, of the non, my paper is called Non-Vanishing on the Line 1. Mm -hmm. And I discussed this uh, in some depth, especially in the higher rank and Langdon Shahidi. Uh, in my discussion, I uh, repeat in a somewhat different language his argument. It's quite beautiful. There's a statement there, which is a deformation of the prime number theorem. It shows that there should be an elementary proof, uh, egotic theory proof. And by the way, uh, recently Richter and de Bergelson gave an egotic theoretic proof of the prime number theorem, elementary proof using Chebyshev and egotic theory. I don't know if you know that, Henry. No, no, I did not. I still have to catch up with you. That's not me. Well, but, they, but they gave a lecture just a mile away from your house about this a few months ago. <laughs> yeah, well, that's uh, in this world. You may as well be next door. I don't see my neighbor. <laughs> by the way, Peter, what I meant by Chebyshev polynomial, the argument should be cosine theta, not theta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that goes without saying. I can't put that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. I yeah. thought you meant the end. Okay. No, 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 no. Good. Any other questions, comments? Okay, so if not, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you. And